Thank you very much for all of you for being on, for being on time. Please take a seat. We are going to start quickly. Uh, we have this afternoon two slots. So the first uh, one that I'm going to chair, it's going to describe the activities of five working groups. And uh, we don't have time for questions after uh, every presentation, but if we have if the speakers are fast, then we can save some time to have some questions at the end of this first slot. Otherwise, we have half an hour of discussion at the end of next slot. OK, the first uh, speaker is, uh, um, is Hero and uh, Working Group 1, Glossary and Catalog of Landsat Early Warning System. So Hero, you have 30 minutes and I will tell you when you have three minutes left. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks to VSL and Manfred. We had a big lunch and we must be sleepy. <laughs> so that's a challenge for all of us. Um, and adding to that, I'm from Japan, which is east of China. Uh, time zone difference is seven hours. So you can imagine how sleepy I am. So, <laughs> so, so you must help me to talk on and on about the activity report, VUZI, working group number one catalog. Um, first of all, I, we, we, as a Landaware Land community, has to be aware that in, in ancient Rome, um, Roman orator Cicero once said, Ignatio futurorum malorum futurior escom uh, gente which means ignorance about the future, especially uh, uh, unfortunate future, is better or useful than the knowledge of it. So the warning, especially warning, is about uh, misfortune, you know, future misfortune. So we are challenging the Kikelos saying, the Romans may not heed to the warning a lot, especially, uh, especially Caesar, Caesar. He didn't give ear to the, to the caution of assassination. And that, you know, he was just assassinated. But to face this challenge, we must be cautious that we cannot issue harmful warning. We have to be professional. We have to be ethically you know, trained to do this kind of work. So that's why working group number one is here. We have to be keep the big picture always in our mind, lest we may provide, you know, uh, the poor quality type of job. And that's not professional. We must be professional. So catalog, we overview the entire world. That's the challenge. <clears throat> Objective of our working is to provide a description of the entire state of the art of the existing rules, both operational and in the final development stage, but not experimental or understudy. In the catalog, well, in the in format of a catalog, we have uh, this legend, and we share the same common terminology and these descriptors, called descriptors, because the, in the catalog we have items. Each country. The, the those descriptors, and then we have matrix a chart, and we cannot do it do without it. It is a core activity. That's why we are number one, and we I think we should first uh, we should finish first. <laughs> so um, there used to be uh, there are many works, in, including Manfred himself, about how the the world is doing in terms of uh, issuing warning in operational manner. And then we are still in this divided state. We are, from statistical point of view, we associate 45 observers, 77. In total, we are 122. But still, how, how, how far have we be divided? Continent, time zone, and way of life. Even, even if we are using online, and the communication between the Graziela and me is seven hours. So I must wake up. I'm actually early riser. So waking up at nine, 
me, which is this hour, is difficult for me. I'm waking up like three or three thirty in the morning. So nine at nine p.m. is for me. It's night. <laughs> so let's work together for better lose. That's the objective of working group one. And then <clears throat> we have done a lot of work from July 2020 when the land aware was created. We start working, and then at the end of the year, December, kickoff meeting, and then kickoff of the catalog, and then the in the next month, January 2021, I was in the field study work, and then in the night I was very tired, and Grazia uh, took up the the position to you know the wake up hero and do some work, and then first draft was carried. Uh, uh, circulated by the end of April, and then catalog format was discussed. And Gratira has done a lot of work. He has, she has labored a lot. That's why we can produce a, this first format. And then May Day was held, and it's all event festival. But we have to work. <laughs> That's the mindset. You know, Norwegian Japanese work. You know, the Italian. The, the, the character, the national character is different from one country to the other. So that's how Landauer is working. So I just want to invite everybody to join together into in this work uh, forum and the consortium. We cherish diversity, both men and women alike. So we, I share and the chairman, chairman, no, no, chairpersonship <laughs> with Graziera. So in after the May Day. We work again. June, catalog partially filled in and further circulation. And then September, grocery first version. And then April, uh, this last April, catalog prototype settled. And then May, brief I try, oops, was produced. Um, that was unfortunate that uh, uh, interprevent in Taiwan got postponed by the uh, in, uh, April or some 2023. So, but we have already uh, submitted the papers about uh, our catalog and how we measure each country's performance. No, 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 not performance, uh, the types. So that's, that's how we have worked. Then the glossary. My sense was to just a catalog, but uh, uh, Graziera already insisted grocery first. So, you know, I, I we worked together <laughs> to produce grocery. And then by item by item, she took a lot of documents and materials from website and URL. And uh, because my background was emergency management, I have worked in FEMA in the United States. So I have piles of paper and uh, documents and from emergency management, uh, management community. And then, because I have worked for CAP, Common Alerting Protocol, at Portrayal, the producer <laughs> gave me a lot of documents, and then I have to digest so many. And then, you know, the reference got bigger and bigger and bigger until we finally decided we should stop here, and then, and we can stop here. So, but because there are um, preceding communities like um, emergency managers and geo community, met the community, how in the world we as a land aware can produce another grocery? That's a mystery. <laughs> but uh, I think we need to have at least one trial to produce grocery. Because, uh, <clears throat> for example, the, each item should be shared by this community. What the hell the, this meaning is. Otherwise, that community cannot stand the, the common language. We have learned a lot from Europe because you know we have we used to be a developing country in Asia. So listening that you are you have the uh, 33 language in Europe, I, as I guess uh, somebody says last time. I don't know, last presenter. 33. It is difficult to share the culture or technology uh, over the different language. So we need to understand the same language, at least in English. First of all, we, we committed to produce the English version 
I never tried another language, so I will not. So somebody will make in the next generation will do that. Um, the grocery for the emergency management from, uh, from a managed management standpoint of view, early warning system has very subtle meaning, but uh, for this land aware community, we have uh, set, set aside a certain definition here. And also the, for the <coughs> UN community has different <laughs> perspectives. So we have searched a lot. And then we can we put that in a, in a reference. So, um, but none of us are, are first English speaking persons. So how <laughs> we produce it, it's a mis another mystery. So grocery. Um, Short remarks for this grocery. The total number is just 150 minimum. It's the smallest cut from the ensemble of those um, concepts and words. But you know, that look at, looking at the AMS, American Meteorological Society, 12,000. Know, we cannot do that voluntarily. So neither is the grocery of geology, 40,000. It's a huge. So IAEG or other communities has a very ex, um, inclusive terms, but not good for land, landslide and land aware community. So that's why we have worked. It's a good experience. And uh, based on those uh, grocery, we put uh, another, pro another product, which is catalog. This is a useful prototype. A, a more than a format, but not uh, some stipulating legal type of, you know, stiff document. It's a very soft document, I would say. Major compilation efforts was, you know, um, done by looking into the published published materials, and then item by item, it's an Excel work uh, prototype. Legend must be set before writing down something useful. So regen. And so it's crossing the continent. We have worked monthly basis and then a version of catalog is proposed tentatively and then another circulation. So um, setting up working group, uh, some working group is, is relatively easy, but working through months over the internet, online, with other cultures, in other time zones, a heavy work. And I have the, uh, domestic duties as a manager and as a researcher in Japan. I am working with 47 prefectural governments, day in and day out. And the, my other voluntary business is this land over, which, which take my night time. <laughs> so, that's how I have worked from on another, other sides of the continent. So tentatively. And then we have measured those um, items, which is landslide RA warning system in one country or one regions and this and try to score it. How, uh, well, here is the test results. So the, the, this catalog can be scored, which I insisted is important because by fitting in this format, you can know your status. You can know where you are by putting you know, your knowledge into this format. Following the same glossary, I mean the same terminology, you can know where you, where you are. Japan, Norway, and Italy, has uh, so much um, operational knowledge. So we put, put, put the all knowledge into the catalog and score it and comp comparison among those three nations were made. And that was uh, not published, but published in, in, in the prevent, uh, coming in the prevent scoring, scoring results, like uh, 37 or something for Japan or something. And Norway and Italy, those, Three countries, uh, I think, I believe, is that uh, take an advantage and you know more uh, 
fruitful model, a mature model, I should say. So we are confident that we are better than others, but uh, we have to demonstrate it by the score, numbers, tells. So short remarks for our catalog. Um, this catalog are not, uh, you know, because of its nature, it's not covering a entire arena of our underwear community. Or, you know, some country like, I wanted to communicate more with China. I, I could, I was able to uh, con make a comment, uh, make a contact with Taiwan colleague. So I, I put in a Taiwan and a Hong Kong colleague, but mainland China, they have fragmented systems. I failed to fill in all the China information. You know, it, it's a concept. So there are tens of systems out there. So I failed to cover the, the entire systems. But for other countries, you know, there are blanks, I mean, vacants from which I want to, you know, I want to make a contact, but in, because of the, the, the COVID and there are many academic events canceled, and so had a hard time to make contact. So allow me to leave this, this status. The size of countries uh, from the, the analysis of the catalog, size of countries matters. So one country has just population size was just 1 million or so, while ours is 120 million, I mean. And the metropolitan Tokyo is 12 million. And uh, the second biggest, even the second biggest prefecture in Japan has 9 million. So the size matters. Like uh, Norway, it's 58 million. Yes, Norway. People. Uh, maybe six, okay. So, you know, unlike me, who, who is working with 128 million size, you know, it, it differs. Some country has like, like uh, tens of thousands, maybe. So we have to be very cautious about comparing one country to the others. Java Island is maybe bigger than most of the European countries. It's like 100 million size, right? So the, uh, <clears throat> the other issue is, of course, inducing causes. Some countries, chose not to do uh, seismic type of landslide, while others are focusing more on snow melt type of landslides or a volcano, I mean. So differs, it, they differ and that's okay. And we, but we have to be know which type of landslides are covered by which systems. So that was included in the catalog. Now, concluding remarks, sorry. Uh, here in working group one, VG one, east meets west, uh, east meets west, not west meets, you say, east meets west. And the name, the very name of Japan is called Japan, but actually Nippon is in Chinese character, it's east. Like Osri in the ancient language, it's east. In the European sense of the word, from the Occident world, Osri used to be East, the East, and in Japan is same for China. China is a center of civilization. That the very meaning of China is center of civilization <laughs> or, or central civilization. And from that point of view, we are just the East, barbarian. So like, like, like Viking, or like many barbarian nations, I know, you know, there are, used to be a civilization and they, we are barbarians, Japanese are barbarian by nature. So East meet West. And both products, which in the catalog and grocery are tentative in their nature. That's the Sagrada Familia in Spain. You know, it's always built under construction, always. That's okay. Most of the working group is still working, but the products are still under construction. That's okay. And the grocery means a practical needs, actually. And that, you know, that is very useful. And the catalog is too, 
It's open for all. It's the format. You can fill in. I will provide on the web, maybe. Oops. Oops. And uh, grocery for uh, another pan global, pan global efforts, such as shares by UK and the EU, will be a, a good uh, successor for us. So that's OK. So reflection of a difference through those activities, those activities are important. You can join, you can take part and voluntarily. You work day and night. <laughs> and uh, you know, the, the, in those difference among countries is very productive. That's why we are here in Switzerland, Zurich. We spent a 17 long hour flight from Japan. Not only me. You know, I deceive five people, you know, my friends to come to. This is very funny and interesting. So come. And they, you know, they, they came. So how, this is how it works. The world is made by men and women alike. People by people. People must meet people. Both East and West must meet. Next time, I really hope, I really do hope China will come. Some Chinese folks will physically attend and they need to join Nowhere. You have so many, many friends. So that's very important. I hope in the future, other countries, no hostile nations, but you know, you know, we can invite many people. At least for landslide early warning, we can join together. There are no enemy. <laughs> no, we just, as a administrator or practitioner, we share knowledge and we share our agony, pain, and toil. We can share the online night together by joining Land Aware community. Thank you very much. I hope the catalog will be a building block for the, this Land Aware. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hiro. So now it's time for the second working group, working group two, and uh, about communication networking. And uh, Stefano Gariano is the responsible person. Not so much responsible, right? Yes. <laughs> no, responsible. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Luca, and thank you, Hiro, uh, for this work building. This catalog. Okay, now the um, working group two is totally different from, um, I, I let me say, the other working groups. Uh, we needed uh, we needed this group, this working group at the beginning, as Landaware was born and was a little baby network. So we we needed to, to learn how to communicate and how to interact with other networks, other institutions and so on. Um, what, we, what we do, what we did uh, is was starting relationship with other, uh, with other networks, other institutions like the International Consortium of Landslides, like the International, International Association of uh, Engineering, Geology and the Environment. Uh, other other um, institution we started uh, um, the, spreading the the verb uh, about uh, about land aware and I, what what I will say also in the, in the preparation in the preparation of several events let me thank uh, I will not make any names uh, I will not list any names but I would like to thank all the people that uh, contributing in this working group also by translating all the messages in different languages from Spanish to French to uh, English I'm sure, uh, for sure and also uh, Jap Japanese and so on and yeah this this was necessary at the at the beginning of the of the of the association um, what i can say is now that the land were grow up and now can communicate by itself so the the working group can be closed now i will uh, i will propose this also in the in the um 
discussion of the last day and also in the assembly that we are going to do at the end of uh, at, by the end of the year because by by our um, agreement cooperation agreement we have to do this uh, uh, assembly with also the renew of the all the um, uh, roles within the within the uh, the networks um, an important thing is, is that uh, an important thing is that we 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 were grown starting from a few tens of people now we are we have a big community um we have uh, we are a big community with several uh, several relationships what i will say what i would like to to tell you is to um, um to, to spread the verb again for regarding uh, regarding landware also within your uh, within your institutions because what we found uh, also in this also in this event uh, is that several persons that are interested in warning systems and so on didn't know didn't were member they were, were not member of uh, landware and didn't know didn't know landware before so we we need still uh, we, we we still need some help from this uh, from this side and uh, if you have any other suggestions about how to improve our communication our networking with other institutions please write to me or write to info at landaware.org um yeah nothing more it just uh, we needed this working group at the beginning i take on this i took on this responsibility but now i think we are we are we are uh, grown enough to to close this working group and to start with a new with a new one uh, by the by new year by the new year so that's all from my side thank you Thank you very much, Stefano. Uh, for sure, we will have time for discussion at the end of this uh, slot. Now is uh, time of uh, to, to move to work package three, working group three. It's about communication with stakeholders. And uh, Katie and Joan are the reference people, but I'm not sure if uh, they are going to make the presentation or it's someone uh, from, from their group, from UGC. So who is, who is online? It's me doing the presentation, Joan Robbins. Okay. Great, great. Please, you have. Shall I share screen? Yeah. <clears throat> Hopefully, it's coming through for you. Is that shared? Uh, coming. Not yet. We still see black. Admin. Sounds like people online can see it. <laughs> not, not yet, John. Please, uh, I, we will. Uh, I will tell you if we see it. We are just, okay. Uh, Stop the presentation and start it again. Try again to share, uh, Joan. Yes, I'm sharing now. Can you see it now? No, it's not coming. Not yet, but uh, well, as an alternative, I may ask you to send an email with your presentation to um, Manfred email or uh, Armin, and uh, and then uh, we can uh, I can move your presentation for you. But okay. uh, maybe I can go forward to the next working group while you send the email to Armin, and then we can uh, uh, talk to you later after working group four. Sounds good for you? Yes, that's fine. Yeah, great. Okay. 
So we move forward to the next working group. So working group four, uh, single slide fact sheet, online educational resources. And Michele Calvello is the reference person from University of Salerno, 20 minutes for you. Thank you very much, Luca. Okay, I was not ready because <laughs> I was expecting to hear you. All right, I guess you can, uh, okay. I can see my presentation, I don't know. They're a bit unlucky with this afternoon uh, session. <laughs> <laughs> so it was not a problem of Joanna from UK. So it's like a local problem. That's so true. at the moment, at least I don't know what people online are seeing, but here on site, we don't the see this. Show screen. The guys on the desk. Okay, can people online uh, hear us? Just uh, to understand this. Do you think that people can hear us? Yes, we can hear you, or I can okay, hear you cool. on your... Because I would propose to Luca, if we are waiting for the problem to be solved, if there are some questions uh, yeah. for the first group, for Hero, maybe... Do, do you have curiosities or questions or um, other things you want to ask? Okay, no, okay, I'm here. <laughs> Wait, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you can go ahead. All right, thank you, sorry. <laughs> okay. Anyway, W uh, Working Group 4, e-learning working group. Um, by now, you know, uh, all of you know very well the website, but I would just want to say that on the web, uh, you can look for uh, WG4 and see, uh, now there is a page, and see what is the objective of the working group. So indeed, as we wrote, uh, we try with through this working group to promote the transfer of skills and knowledge uh, by, by, you know, by means of educational products, uh, educational products that can be used online or over the internet. Uh, the activities that we set up when deciding uh, you know, how to create initially two years ago this working group, uh, we wrote uh, short courses, webinars, digital leaflets, panel discussions, everything indeed, interactive games. Well, what did we do so far? Uh, I'm chairing this group. There is uh, supposedly a lot of people in this working group like in the other working groups, but at the end of the day, as you all know, no, most of you are members of LEND, aware already, some of you are here, if you're not a member, you know, you will decide to join later. And anyway, this is the first two years of the network. And it's also the first two years for each working group. So within this working group, I don't want you to read the names, although, yeah, you know, I was not expecting for them to be readable. At, 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 this is so huge that you can even read the names. But I just want to tell you, yes, 37 associates, many more observers. At the end of the day, we managed to have only two online meetings. And it was also, you know, not because people were not participating, but also as a choice afterwards. Uh, both last year, few participants in the meetings there, but, you know, in order to carry on some activities in the working group, uh, you know, the, num the absolute numbers are not important, as long as there are some people that dedicate, you know, extra time rather than you know, their working hours uh, for which they are paid for uh, to these activities. So you can see, um, March 2021, 
essentially we prepared for the May Day, May 2021. And then uh, in the May Day, uh, we managed to uh, host two sessions. So the, our results are indeed these two sessions. And you can uh, uh, see that in the first session, we there was a discussion about interactive educational experience experiences uh, with presentations by people that you know had something to say about it uh, from Juefe Jota in Brazil, but also Graziella with uh, some serious games and uh, uh, the early warning system, young professional group. It's an interesting group that is doing a lot of things out there on uh, you know, activities. And they presented something. And then there, is a, there was another session when uh, we were uh, interactively working um, to create a single slide fact sheet. You can see these sessions if you miss them, because uh, as most of the sessions, we recorded them, they are there, they are on the playlist, so you know you can go back. So those were results that our working group somehow had for last year. Out of those, uh, we had another, as we said, meeting, and out of the second meeting, uh, there was a working plan for the next coming months. And so by now I can tell you that uh, those two specific tasks that were assigned almost one year ago were carried out by few of us, personally with Anne Felsberg uh, in the single slide fact sheets project, and also Isabella Horta and Puja mainly you know, like with uh, these other activities that I will tell you soon. So single slide fact sheets, we have a prototype uh, um, on the web. So the project was aiming at highlighting at a glance the main characteristics of operational lens other warning systems. We decided to start with some of them, essentially with you know, two of them, but the second one in Italy has three different components. And then we put things together after without, you know, you can go on the web, there is a web page. I'm just showing the results. So the fact sheets look like this. So this is one, Hong Kong. Essentially, we are. You no, know, it, took, it took us a long time you know, to come up with these. But at the end, you know, you highlight. We wanted to highlight the main things from. Um, I don't know if I guess. You, can you see this? No, no. Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, so type of lenses and so forth. How to get to different the different elements of the operational systems. You can see that. It looks, the format is the same for every fact sheet. Here we have Piemonte region. Piemonte region, uh, indeed, uh, they developed three different systems. The first one related to shallow landslides, the second one related to debris flows, the third one related to active uh, slides, translation and rotation slides. So we have uh, you know, prototypes there. Uh, on the web, and we our plan is to continue with this. So at the moment we have four, fact sheets there, and we can have more. Of course, so fact sheets are fact sheets, are just single pages. Then you have the references to um, material if you want to know more about these systems. Second project, the second project is still a work in progress. So we didn't manage to know, have it on the web yet. Uh, but uh, as many of you know, because at some point we sent an email to the full community, uh, we shared, um, actually, if I go on the web, does it show uh, in the, on the page? If I click on the li link and I go on the web, is it shared or not? No, okay, I'm trying, it doesn't work, then it doesn't matter. Maybe because there is not even, the, oops, I lost. No, but anyway, it's not going in the, on the link anyway. So, okay, it doesn't matter, doesn't matter, don't worry. I go back to the presentation. So, um, in the um, shared Google Sheet that we are using for each uh, item that is a potential source of uh, uh, as material for e-learning, we have uh, you know, highlighted a few uh, characteristics. And uh, the idea is also that, you know, somebody is reviewing those uh, in order to answer the questions. Uh, is the content understandable? Are there explanatory elements? Uh, what is, uh, you know, are there interactive activities and so forth? And on this, I want to say that uh, Isabella needs some help now in terms of, you know, 
yes, up to a point you can do it in one or two people, but then, you know, if possible, uh, if interested, um, people that are listening today to me here live or, or like from the web, uh, just get in contact with me, with Isabella, and uh, we, we can streamline the final part so that at least even for this activity before the end of the year, we can say that we have a prototype there on the web. As you was saying, you know, we are doing things, it's always a work in progress, but you know, let's come up, come out for you know, with this activity. So if you're interested uh, to help, not only if you're interested, but if you're interested in helping us, uh, go ahead. Finally, last thing that we did uh, in the past few months, uh, here I was mentioning the SHEAR program, Mirjana Budimir, she's from, um, um, uh, she, she, you know, she was there very active in the program. The program indeed from the UK is over, but at the end of the program, we managed to, together with Anne Felberg and, and myself, to come out with uh, these three other products. So we have two infographics for local and territorial warning systems, and we also have a, a very short video um, uh, introduction to lens other warning systems. Where do you find them? You find them in, uh, if you go on our website, the website there is a post that is the new media resources on lens other warning systems, so you find them there. That's, that's it from my side. Uh, we will have time on uh, Wednesday to discuss about, uh, I guess, the future of all working groups, therefore also the future of the Ironic Working Group, and this is it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michele. Um, let's go back to working group four. Joanne, are, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Should I try sharing again? Oh, uh, it's disabled sharing. You cannot start share screen. But uh, sorry for this small uh, issue, but we are now uploading your presentation. Can you, can you try again with sharing? Can you, John, can you try again one more time sharing? Yeah. Yeah. Has that come through? Um, no, no. Apparently okay. they can see it online. So, no, it doesn't work. But John, we do in this way. So I'm gonna share the presentation from here and use, you hope you can see, I hope you can see it. I guess you can see it and you can say next and I can move your slides. It's okay. I, okay, hang on, cause I can't see it. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing cause it tells me I'm still sharing. So can you now share? Because I can't see what you're showing, if you see what I mean. Yeah. We are working on that. I can see it now, that's great. Yeah, okay, great. You can go and I can move the okay, presentation that, for you. That's great. Thank you. Um, so yes, this is for working group three. So communication with stakeholders. And this is um, between myself and Katie Freiber from um, British Geological Survey. So we co-chair this, this working group. Next slide, please. So just to go through um, the initial aim of the working group, um, initially, we were looking to promote the involvement and engagement of stakeholders. Um, it's, the discussion this morning was really um, enlightening, I think, in this point, um, that it's so important to include stakeholders when we're developing landslide early warning systems. And so this working group was really aimed to um, understand how we do that engagement effectively, how we maintain and sustain it, um, and also how we incorporate it into our development and, and model design. So within the um, working group, we were looking to achieve some activities. Some of these were including workshops and, and video meetings, plus feedback from users. Um, we also wanted to undertake um, some sort of responder and stakeholder involvement. So really understanding how this is done across our various projects um, and across our, our various regions. 
and also be able to share knowledge and skills um, around the language and standardization requirements for engaging with stakeholders if indeed that work that makes sense to do so next slide please so one of our early activities was to issue a questionnaire so this went out in april 2021 and we actually presented some of the findings of this questionnaire at the um May Day workshop. Um, the, the questionnaire went predominantly out to the working group membership and we really wanted to understand how the partners were um, engaging with their wider stakeholders um, and the challenges that were being faced by these uh, members of our group. So the key findings were really that this was quite an early part um, we were still very early days I think in the landslide community with regard to engagement with stakeholders. Um, and the real cross disciplinarity of this work does make it challenging, particularly around issues of language. And I think this came up in the discussions earlier. There was also questions about education. And I think this links very nicely with working group four. Um, but there were also challenges around the expectations, the capabilities and the varying range and, and nature of the stakeholder requirements. So one of the big questions that we were asking were how do we achieve understanding how do we engage with this variety of stakeholders and, and how do we bridge the gap between the capabilities we have in science but the expectations that scientists um, and stakeholders may have of the different systems and this then leads into questions around how do we communicate uncertainty effectively so in terms of the lessons learned um, we wanted to as I say, understand the stakeholder and, and user needs and, and how we could better engage with them. Um, there are There is this ability that we could link very closely with the, with the e-learning group, so working group four, and I think also with, the, with working group one, particularly around the catalogue and the language that is used. But I think what really came out of the questionnaires was that, as I say, it was still very early days for many of the people who were engaging in this work. In fact, working group three membership is heavily biased towards physical or natural scientists, and we have very few stakeholders within that group. And so this really led us to think, well, what does this really mean for working group three going forward? Next slide, please. So bearing in mind that we'd had some challenges, um, recognizing the perhaps the the split in our in our working group i think what me and katie really came to realize is that we are really on a mission here to bring together the new resources that are available um, and really show the value but also mechanisms by which you can engage more regularly with stakeholder groups but also understand the different mechanisms that may be beneficial or, or more challenging and how do you uh, properly accommodate that in your project design so what i wanted to highlight here and it's been mentioned by michaela already is that there's some very interesting final outputs from the shear program um, these are listed here so some of them include frameworks for um, implementing early warning systems and particularly framing the challenges and lessons learned from a user perspective there are also elements in here around user-centered design, visualization, all aspects that are critically important to make sure that warnings are communicated effectively with users. And there's also work here that talks about the challenges for making operational systems, particularly realizing that there needs to be um, strong um, chains in the forecasting development process. And so uh, Raina earlier today mentioned the um, high weather project of WMO. There is a flagship project in that which details the, um, the value chain, which we talk about in a weather forecasting context as something that takes account of things like observations, how you develop models for weather forecasting, how you um, develop information around impacts, how you might then lead into the warning communication, the dissemination, and then the feedback strategy around the response. And really understanding the elements of that value chain can be really important in determining where your bottlenecks are and whether users can find value in the information you provide. So these um, sort of resources here are potentially really valuable to us in the landslide community, as I think they allow us to leverage off expertise in other areas, which we might find valuable in our own uh, research areas. I also want to highlight the bottom here that that project has a new book, 
Um, the launch event was on YouTube. The link is provided there. The book is open access, but it covers a very wide range of aspects. And again, this follows very closely with the value chain. So talking about early warning systems and their role in disaster risk reduction, all the way through to sort of how do we uh, generate warnings for decision makers? How do we forecast? How do we warn? How do we connect hazards with impacts? Um, and how do we connect weather with hazard information? Um, all the way through to pulling that together into an end-to-end -end system. So if there's um, interest from, from the group here, I think that would be a great resource to, to tap into. Next slide, please. Also, just to highlight that within Working Group 3, um, we've done several different aspects of communication. Some of these have been blogs, some of them have been through conferences. I'm not going to go through each of these, but um, I'd really welcome people to take a look at these resources. In every case, um, I've tried to pull out here elements that are of particular relevance to the stakeholder side. So really picking out sides that delve into the questions of how do we engage with our stakeholders? What is the value of the stakeholder in our development process? Um, how can we weave that information in both to automated products and non-automated products? Um, and also where do they fit in this sort of end-to-end -end chain? Next slide, please. I also just wanna highlight some new and upcoming research that our members shared with us. Um, and these research projects are either kicking off now or have been um, or fairly new still. So the, the first one is the Human Tech Nexus, Building a Safe Haven for Climate Extremes is a Rise in Europe project, which will be covering um, several European countries. And each of the demonstrators that are listed, so there are 10 in total, have an end user perspective to them. So we hope that there'll be some knowledge which can be shared back with the land aware community through that. The second project here is a multi-hazards and emergent risks in North Euro Northern Europe. Katie can provide more details on this, on this project, but there's also a link here for more details. Um, there's also a FLOM risk project, which was provided by Graziella. Um, this is a project in Norway, which includes governmental departments, uh, as well as public road administration, and is covering four municipalities. So really interesting to see how, how that fits with the government engagement um, and that long-term legacy. And the final one here is Inform at Risk, Participatory Landslide Early Warning Systems, a partnership between Colombia and Germany. And I welcome you to, to look at the video that's attached to this. Um, it's a really interesting video which presents uh, some first versions of a cartoon, which hopes to explain the aspects of a monitoring system set up in the country. Next slide, please. So um, this is just to sort of say thank you very much for listening, um, but also just to highlight a couple of upcoming things. So there's the Understanding Risk Global Forum in, two, in uh, this year, and there's also the UK Alliance for Disaster Research Conference also later this year. And we'll shortly be having the International DRR Day as well, all of which are great areas to, to focus around the, the user needs. I think one of the things from a working group three perspective that we need to think about going forward is how we are able to work closely with stakeholders within the context of land aware in this working group. We know that it is very challenging um, to resource engagement with stakeholders. And also stakeholders have a preference about who they engage with. And that's typically individuals at a national level or um, even just a one-on-one, -on -one, so who they actually prefer to talk to on a day-to-day -day basis in an organisation. So how we do that and how we capture that information in Land Aware is going to be a critical way for us to think of going forward. Um, there is a final slide here, I'm not going, not going to go on to it, but hopefully the, the slides will be made available, which just has some further resources which we hope will be of use to people who are interested in looking at stakeholder engagement as part of their development of landslide early warning systems. So that's everything from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joan, and sorry again for this small issue we had. So next uh, working group is working group five. It's uh, innovations in lens like early warning systems and Manfred Seiley is a reference person. So Manfred, you have 15 minutes. Okay. <clears throat> 
So when we started LandAware, I proposed that we should have a working group on innovations. And of course, innovations is everywhere in all aspects of landslide early warning systems. So it might be a little bit strange to have a, a working group that claims that we are dealing with the innovations here. But of course, um, there is a reason why I proposed this land aware working group. <clears throat> As you have seen this morning, but also in other occasions, we know quite well that established land, uh, regional, national landslide early warning system, they have been working a lot with established methods. So this using precipitation mainly as uh, uh, main information for uh, alerting. Um, that, that's what I wanted to challenge a little bit. So I wanted to, to see a little bit uh, what other very new upcoming technologies for um, prediction or for observing critical states, what's, what are these uh, innovative uh, methods that are upcoming now? And of course, the goal was then <clears throat> to promote such, such new research innovations in this working group um, and to highlight ideas and experiences that are related to these novel methods. And these methods, they are, no, they are promising, but they are not well proven yet. So I wanted to generate a little bit of a discussion between the researchers, those who are developing these innovations and those who are supposed to use these innovations, the operators. So fundamentally was also the goal to discuss what is needed to su successfully implement such innovations for operational use. So that was the, the setting I had in mind. And what came out was um, we had in total eight workshop meetings, uh, work, working group meetings, sorry, in these two years. Um, you can see here, a uh, classical snapshot of one of these meetings. We have on one hand, uh, all the participants in this working group. It's mainly researchers, but also a few uh, from the operational services. And then we have a common working document and we have a chat. So it's a, quite an interactive moment of one and a half hour, these uh, working group sessions and always with a specific topic on that uh, day to highlight one or several new innovations. If you look back at these uh, eight meetings, uh, was first this kickoff where we tried to find out a little bit what was the interest of this community here. Then we had a first meeting on distributed acoustic sensing, a very intriguing new technology, which is upcoming. And here's Susan Wellett from the University of Calgary was presenting uh, their findings, ex experiences. And we had the May Day um, where we had four innovative uh, technologies or methods presented, one by Anna Felsberg, another by Scania Rossi, Jim Whiteley some presented something and Fabian Walter. And here we were for the first time successful to involve also a little bit uh, uh, people from operational services to discuss uh, what are their perspectives with regard to innovations? How are they using? Uh, what do, do they think about in including new ideas in in existing warning systems, what's the difficulties there? So that was quite an interesting uh, discussion we had. <clears throat> and then the following five um, meetings were again focusing on, on one specific innovation, 
John Metzger presented something about his uh, work with regard to EO data, INSAR and terrestrial data, uh, a case study from, from Northern America. Um, Rosa Palau showed how they include soil moisture data and soil moisture information in a warning system in, in Catalonia, in uh, Spain. And we had a, a very active uh, session on soil moisture again with a contribution from Adrian Vicky here, but also Annette Patton who showed an example from Alaska. And the last two meetings were on crowdsourcing. So what, how can we get information from, from the internet, from Twitter or other channels in a real time to include to use make use of that in real time so as you know we a lot of this crowdsourcing has been used for um, for making inventories for creating inventories this is not a, a real time application this is a, a post event application of course but we discussed here a little bit more how could we use such crowdsourced information in, in real time for, for the purpose of warning in the end. And the last uh, working group meeting was in September about a wireless network of sensors um, demonstrated for the case of Berkeley by Sebastian Ullemann. So that's a little bit what you see the, 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 the different topics we discussed. Um, I can also mention that we were about 20 to 30 at attendees in, war, in every meeting. I said already it's, it's attracting more the, the research community here a little bit. That's, uh, a little bit sad because I, we really had the intention that this should be uh, also uh, of, of key interest to, to operators. So I sent out a, um, a feedback uh, questionnaire to our working group members and asked a little bit um, what of this information was useful to you uh, what topics specifically were of interest? I got feedback here. Um, it seems that this format, this workshop, and also these topics that we addressed were um, useful and interesting to, or uh, very useful and interesting to more than half of the people. So <laughs> it seems that this is uh, something that uh, people appreciate. Also a little bit this, this format of uh, people can come and consume, can come and listen if they have time, if they want. It's not very ambitious with regard to uh, producing products out of this working group. It's more informative uh, setting. I also asked a little bit what topics of innovation did you miss in these previous meetings? And I got some ideas for, for next um, meetings. Uh, as we heard all, already this morning, this uh, question of uncertainty, how can we deal with uncertainty in all respects, uh, could also be better addressed in, in this uh, working group. There was somebody who proposed we, that we should address climate change in forecasting models. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, this has been made very often now so far in in this warning community. So there are ideas around how we, what topics we could add. And here now a few personal thoughts from my side. I thought these meetings were stimulating. It was uh, a, pleasing, a pleasing att attendance. And as I said, we reached mainly the research people with this uh, working group. And we have not really managed to attract the members of the operational services very much. I think that so we had also the plan to uh, 
enable a post-meeting discussion. We, for example, we set up a Slack uh, a Slack um, channel where we could continue discussing afterwards. This not was not very actively used. It's always uh, difficult to get the activity from a meeting uh, to to sustain that for for a longer period. But still, there are uh, we have tried um, to allow for for such post meeting discussions. And as I said, tangible products from the working groups have been less important for the participants so far. So the working group has been more a kind of a forum for exchange. So potential ways forward, we could continue in the same way. That's um, many of these uh, answers that I got in this uh, this uh, inquiry uh, in, in this um, questionnaire. <clears throat> they they proposed actually that we should continue uh, like like before. I think we could try to strengthen uh, the focus on how operators uh, of Lancet early warning systems deal with these ideas that are promising but not yet established. Personally, for me as a researcher, that we, would be very interesting to to know better. And. Uh, we also once had the proposal that we could create a common demonstrator somewhere which could act as a playground for testing and <laughs> demonstrating such innovations. So it, um, of course that would need a host who takes that uh, uh, as a, one of his tasks to provide such a uh, a playground, but that would be, a, of course, a, an excellent showcase for everybody who can contrib contribute to this uh, demonstrator. And it would be a, a very nice product from Landaware, I think, in the end, if that could be established. But uh, they're here. If we would go this way, uh, there are questions of how can we finance this here? Uh, how can we organize it? So it's a little bit a bigger uh, project, but still to be discussed. And then there is a, a fourth uh, potential way forward. This is that we would merge with another working group that has also very strong focus on uh, innovations, uh, IoT-based methods on ana and analysis. This would be another option. Uh, the, the reason why I'm talking about this fourth um, option is there are many of the members from working group eight are also member of, of the working group five. So there is a quite an overlap here. That's what I have to report from uh, working group five. And of course we will discuss that at the end of, of the session. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Manfred. Well, we have 20 minutes. If you have any questions, curiosity or suggestions, I guess are very much appreciated. So if you, do you have something to say? Yeah, you. One moment, yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Stahil, Stahil? I'm Manfred, sorry, yeah. I don't know how to pronounce the name. Uh, sir, the star Slack group is somehow not accessible. I tried to connect to it a couple of times. Yeah, it, there was some weeks where it was uh, down. Now it's on again, so I think it should work again. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, it has not been very actively used. That's, uh, it's maybe also my problem. I'm not very... Uh, innovative with regard to Slack. <laughs> <laughs> so there might be other people who are better dealing with these uh, uh, systems, but <clears throat> yeah, it should, it should run again. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Other curiosities, suggestions are very welcome. Yeah, Michele here and then. Now, uh, <clears throat> I would like to, um, 
a comment on the fact that for the future, of course, on Wednesday we will have a discussion, but thinking about uh, the working groups that have been presented so far, working group three by Joe, working group five by Manfred, uh, how to involve uh, more like, operators, you mentioned, you know, there was not so many. I think it should be you know, a, a key uh, effort from uh, no, those working groups and from Landware in general to try to involve more uh, operators that indeed are part of the network, but you know sometimes they hide and don't know, only some specific people maybe participate. So I want to comment and uh, give these to, uh, to to Manfred and Joe specifically WP working group three and five. Uh, we should involve operators more in the activities. So, and then maybe I have a question for uh, Joe uh, related to this. Uh, stakeholders because the group they are is about stakeholders who are they indeed and who, who do we want to involve in land aware no by, by means of land aware what kind of stakeholders are we trying to uh, get into uh, in, into the network therefore into the working group and so forth Joanne uh, so I think um, we've been fairly flexible with who we would incorporate obviously we can't really open it up to the whole general public so that's probably not going to work um but i think what the kinds of things we were hoping for were people from say the rail industry uh the transport industry um maybe those in the agricultural sector who have knock-on effects from from landslide events um i think the challenge really here because we, we actually did make an attempt to make contact with everybody who replied to our questionnaire we sent out a subsequent message asking for their stakeholder a stakeholder list basically so would they be happy to share a stakeholder contact with us we got very little response to that and i think there's two reasons for that one is that um there's having a stakeholder relationship is built over time and often stakeholders approach things on a one-to-one -one basis so they become very they become very well connected with individuals within an organization um, and so it can become challenging when you then try and open that out to a wider set of people also when they're not sure what the purpose of that meeting is so one of the things I think is particularly important if we go down this route is that we have a very clear remit of why we want stakeholders to participate in this group and that they get benefit from it as well I think the second point on that is that the um, when we asked for the, the the stakeholders, many of the people within the projects were only just starting out on that journey, it seemed. And I think many people may have had very cursory interactions with their stakeholder groups, but were perhaps not in a position to, to share a stakeholder in confidence. There's also obviously the language barrier as well. So we need to be mindful of those aspects when we talk about in, including stakeholders in this working group. Thank you very much for your answer. We have another question. Thank you. Just a comment about the last point of Manfred about the demonstrator. Uh, I think this is really a very good idea, but I mean, I see also one of the main problems that we are talking about landslides and we know how complex this term is. So a single demonstrator would be probably not ideal because it would be uh, not easy to demonstrate uh, that this new technology would work also in different contexts. So one of the possibilities is to build on what we have already. So there are several places that we have uh, long-term monitoring. Uh, just make the example of Ilkraben, for example, for debris flows. So in this area, maybe if someone wants to test a demonst and demonstrate innovation, uh, maybe they can go there and demonstrate whether the new innovative methodology is working. So probably one of the ideas would be to select internationally, because we are an international community, some places that could be uh, the key points. So ideal for demonstrating new innovation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess that that's uh, more or less the reason why you were proposing at the end as a last point, the merge with uh, working group eight and uh, having this demonstrator. 
because this is something that in work package eight, it's one of the aim is to have case studies or pilots or demonstrators, whatever, where we have monitored sites. So we have data, some others have models. So who is lacking models? Someone is lacking data. We can put things together and we can try to, yeah, but we were sure we can discuss about that uh, in detail tomorrow uh, or uh, later this afternoon. Any other, yes, Hero? I myself is, I'm very interested in innovations because I'm busy, so I, I was, uh, not fortunate enough to join all the times, but uh, innovation is one thing, the renovation is quite another. And these days we are under digital transformation in Japan, major transformation. And that takes a lot of time for me. From digital, uh, from analog world to digital world, there are established methods in land uh, uh, landslide early warning in, in analog way. I mean, the, in the, for the study, most of the, the past study was done in analog way. And then we are now in a completely different world. <laughs> so putting things that was established in analog and then some sort of transform up, migrate, or well, immigrate to uh, digital world is quite another, it's another te technique or technology. So, that's why I brought my three of my friends and data analysis here. They will uh, distribute, hand out uh, several materials afterwards. You can distribute it now, zero order statistics. We have established a method, a method, a Japanese method in, in analog world. But that was done by an, an, just a couple of hundred of experts, very meticulous way of analyzing in, in you know, the analog way. But now in the them, digital elevation maps, the, the resolution is different. So that's why we need to renovate. Once done in analog, may not be doable <laughs> in a digital world. So that's another challenge. I think many countries face the same challenge, renovation, renovation. Not, not uh, okay. simple transformation and not a simple migration. But we need a method. Even the rain gauge, it's not, it's not analog anymore. It's digital. So we need to think more in digital way, digital manner. That's the, another big challenge, not only for land aware community, but I think the geo community, met community, all face the same challenge. So I think we can share the common challenge to, to be a partnership you know, to be a, become a good friend. So that's my, wait, this is here, Japanese um, a trial of renovation of analyzing land, landscape data, uh, digital elevation maps in, into the new model. Renovate, this is not a new, this is renovation. So we think really seriously about the renovation as well as innovation, which is the most uh, monitoring and censoring type of things. We need to think more drastically about how we can migrate things from analog to digital. That's very important. Otherwise, we're gonna discard everything <laughs> in the past study. You know, we are living in a digital world. We have to sort of think another way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hiro. So Hiro is saying we need to keep uh, track and we need to remember what we have monitored somehow and to keep learning from that. Uh, any other comments or questions or curiosities? Well, I, I would say that we need to renovate our caffeine level so we can have a coffee break now and uh, 15 minutes, right? Or we keep, or we can have it uh, longer. What do you think, Manfred? Uh, yeah. If I can make another comment, uh, because, you know, maybe there's some time. Uh, 
working group one hero uh, you produce this uh, catalog glossary okay it's a work in progress yes but anyway it's there and also i can see from uh, joe working group three uh, the slides that you, you know um put there there were a lot of links to projects and uh, lists uh, that could be useful as resources online uh, i would uh, you know promote the, you know, to, i would tell to both of you we should think about uh, uh, how to put those things online as soon as possible in a way that we you know feel uh, comfortable with knowing that it's you no know, an ongoing work and uh, I can uh, say that maybe we can also interact with WG4 if you want uh, in order to see uh, what is the best possible way. But anyway, you know, it should be something that I think it's a moment before uh, the General Assembly or even you know, in the next few months to, to really put it there. So just my comment about uh, working group one and three products. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, okay, so uh, we can uh, have the coffee break and uh, do we stick with the three? Four? Okay, yeah. Uh, then I would say that we can have a break and we can uh, start again at uh, 15.45. Okay, so please have a seat. Okay. Let's start the final part of this long, long day. Um, three working groups uh, are um, less. So um, that, uh, we are, in the meantime, Dalia sent her presentation to, to Armin. We will start with the working group seven, operational landslide early warning systems. The working group was and is led by uh, Graziella. So, uh, please, Graciela, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, no, I will. Hmm. I'll, I'll. There's a move. Uh, can you end? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, so I will try also to summarize the activity uh, done um, since uh, we started the land aware. Uh, this working group is called Operational Lens Layer Early Warning System. Uh, we had mm, the main aim to promote the international collaboration. Uh, first of all, with those that have uh, operational uh, uh, system, but also for those that are in a development stage. And the idea is to discuss common strength limitation and also provide the example of, um, of best practice and lessons learned. Uh, but it, it came out um, already, I think, uh, in uh, the meeting we had in Perugia, uh, the needs of um, having a kind of uh, uh, guidelines or a list at least of um, uh, requirement that they are necessary when we need to uh, want to have uh, our system to be operated uh, operational so uh, we um, we had this as a main aim in our uh, working group uh, we are at the moment um, 192 uh, between associate and, and observer um we had the activity in uh, we start of course with this uh, land land aware kickoff meeting uh, in 2020 um uh, with the first presentation of the group and also we started to have a presentation of state of the art of lens light early warning in central america um, also in 2021, we have um, meetings to organize the group and see what uh, if we should be on the uh, yeah on the same uh, object or we have to change. We were, were taking part of the land aware May Day. Uh, we had two round table uh, discussing about similarity, difference, and interaction between national, regional, and local. And we have also a live uh, session from Norway, and all of this is available online. 
uh, in the YouTube uh, channel. Um, <clears throat> so in uh, this year, we have been working uh, uh, a small group of us in uh, the starting with this guideline, uh, starting from a, a draft uh, of a checklist. Um, um, we had one that we have been written for um, a, a, a paper that was published, uh, a proceeding actually from uh, the World Landslide Forum, uh, is a, a, talking about the Norwegian um, system, but we, we created there already a kind of list, so we start with this list and um, um, we also start to draft a, a, a document um, divided in three parts, what is the learn, lens layer learning, which are the main requirements and what you need to make uh, operational a system. Of course, we have to start, uh, we, we discussed also already this morning that uh, uh, we need these uh, four uh, elements, uh, the early warning system, uh, the risk assessment, monitoring, communication and response, but uh, I, I was insisted all the time that is not only that, we need uh, uh, the social part or uh, the, the, the financial aspect, the policy and the legacy, uh, the stakeholder requirement. Also, we have to take into account the social and cultural setting, uh, skill and knowledge, and uh, also the environmental setting. And uh, we start to um, start to uh, list up uh, things that we need. For example, uh, we need, uh, in order to be operational, we need the communication channel and the chain of command that should be defined. Uh, technical readiness proved uh, and checked. The system should be accepted and, and used. Uh, we need a, a system that should be integrated into legacy and policy, uh, feedback and improvement and uh, backup system, redundancy, training and knowledge sharing, constantly system check, validation and updating uh, if uh, the uh, conditions are changed. And uh, for each one of these boxes, ideally we would like to uh, write down a kind of list. So you have to do this and this, uh, and eventually um, presenting some example that can be used uh, as a sem uh, example for, uh, for, uh, for this type of requirement, uh, let's say. Um, we, um, yeah, we, we start to work in this, but we, we, we have still a lot to do. In, uh, in this part, and this should be probably the, 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 most, the main task for next year. Um, we had also a regional uh, meeting uh, just before summer. Uh, this was actually an idea that arrived after the May Day. Um, we had the three regional meetings. Um, one uh, for the all Latin American country, it was Spanish speaking, another with all Brazilian people, uh, uh, speaking Portuguese, and another with the Indian Himalaya region uh, talking English. And this because we, we realized during the May Day that some of the operators uh, are um, feel uh, comfortable to speak in their own language, and this was uh, really useful. So what we did during this regional meeting was to uh, you, yeah, review, starting to review the catalog, prepare for the working group one for each of these regions, just to say, okay, do you know if there are other um, that are uh, not in, indicated in the, in the catalog? Also, we made a, a simple survey um, to, to know about um, the participants and also discussing how to promote future collaboration. Uh, the meeting was also open to non uh, land aware members uh, and we decided that uh, yeah original language uh, for for a better communication of the participants we invited uh, 54 of the land aware associate for these three region uh, 30 uh, 48 attended the meeting but i have to say the 15 of them were not land aware members so it was uh, really uh, very useful, uh, especially in uh, the Latin American uh, region. 
Um, 28 of them answered the, 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 the survey and uh, the were majority of people are working at university and governmental institution. Uh, 14 uh, of these 28 are uh, partially or fully involved in operational lens leveling system and mainly operational and experimental one. Uh, here is the number of participants. So uh, here I divide the blue are the people that are uh, uh, registered as a land aware member, and uh, the um, uh, in orange are people that attending the the meeting. And you can see in Brazil there was a interest. So there are more people that are not necessary uh, from uh, land aware. Also in uh, other uh, other country in Central America, indicating that there is a lot of interest for this topic. Um, we ask uh, different questions here. I just present some of them. Uh, so we were asking uh, which are your, the major needs in your country and of course a reliable uh, database, uh, lens the inventory in order to create a good thresholds is probably the most, uh, the major need, but also improve uh, uh, the communication of the, um, uh, the, the improving the communication of uh, with the people living in the risk area and uh, which is the same about more educational project with, with the people living in the in the risk area um, uh, another was uh, uh, to the, to uh, uh, to ask the um, the main challenge that uh, uh, prevent the organization of the operational system and uh, of course uh, uh, many of them uh, um, indicated that the lack of financial support is probably the, the major uh, uh, limitation. Uh, also, the lack of institutional interest uh, in um, uh, creating an operational system, which go together with the lack of political mandate, because it's not clear which organization, especially in developing country, which, which organization uh, has the main mandate. Um, uh, and also, in some cases, uh, um, I think it's quite important also to consider the lack of uh, uh, lens like expertise in some case or the lack of basic tool. Um, also, since we had a lot of people from academia, we were asking, for example, if they are teaching um, lens early warning system in their courses, and the majority they say no, but uh, some of them they they teach as a part of other pensum. Uh, also, we were asking if um, it could be useful in the in the future to have, um, for example, a specific uh, master program or bachelor program. I don't know specific on lens early warning system. And so we get some answer that maybe it could be useful to have a focus lecture on lens early warning system as a part of other program, which is maybe more uh, interesting and. Also also, we ask how land aware uh, can assist you, and uh, everybody was happy to have this regional meeting, uh, and they would like to continue uh, because it was uh, really useful for them to to bring the country or, or the, the 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 region together, and uh, also organize workshop. And many of them say affordable because uh, yes, uh, not everybody can travel abroad. Uh, sharing experience, tools, and uh, documents, um, uh, some support during the operation, for example, or a specific situation in the in, in some country, uh, preparing com a common standard, which is what um, we, we we want to to do in uh, anyway in the working group, and also helping with the educational program that can be used. Uh, um, in the region. Uh, the people that we are coordinating these both uh, guideline and regional meeting, uh, uh, we have different people. Uh, they are from Canada, Corey, uh, from UK, Christian, uh, in, uh, Minu, Teresa from India, and Sesha, uh, Davide from Italy, and uh, Paolo and Isabella from Brazil. Um, so please, if you have some um, uh, people that want to join us uh, for this activity, especially for the guideline, but also for the regional meeting. So the plan is to 
Mm, yeah, to fini <laughs> finish uh, the che uh, this checklist or document about the kind of guideline and prepare for publication and possible pu publish, but this uh, very, uh, as <laughs> Corey say, we do not have time, we need young people <laughs> to help us. Um, for the regional meeting, uh, okay, maybe the the next plan is to summarize what we have done so far and, and publish uh, maybe in the Landware page um, and uh, review the list of uh, future activities that have been recommended by the groups. Uh, many of them uh, want to have new meetings with this region, so maybe we should organize other meetings, uh, uh, but also maybe meeting with other regions. Um, in, I don't know, uh, in Japan or <laughs> with the specific region to able to speak uh, in the original language. This is always the idea. Uh, yeah, and that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Graziella. Uh, so I'll move back to working group six. Uh, landslide early warning system data. Uh, Dalia? Hi, can well, you hear me? Hello. Hello. Well, I, my sincere apologies for not being there in person. I, um, I really would have loved to. Um, and I knew that I am also representing with uh, my colleague, Ben Miris from USGS, who is a co-lead here, um, and Thomas Stanley, who's also been helping with this um, as well as others. So, um, well, so thank you so much for your patience and, um, and I hope the meeting has been very successful. Good morning from the US. And, um, and so what I'd like to present a bit about is our, our working group six, which is really focusing on data. And the goal that we set forth when this started was really to promote open data and sharing of information that can be useful for the types of systems that Graciela has just presented on and, and, and really trying to create an open environment to support development, you know, fine tuning and evaluation of those models, et cetera. And so we have a three, four main goals that we've been working towards. Um, we held meetings in the fall and the spring of uh, 21 to 22, um, but it's fallen off a little bit in the last couple months um, for a number of reasons. One is that I've taken a, a new position at NASA as the Director of Earth Sciences, so that's been um, a bit, uh, a lot more of my time, but we will continue to move forward and Ben Miris and I are, are going to actively engage in this. So if you go to the next slide. So what I wanted to do is take you through kind of where we, have um, discussed with our working group and, and we kind of had a fluctuating number of members, but, um, but I think that you know, what we've talked about is the issue of the fact we have so many different types of data that are needed to support and, and the reliability and the timeliness of that information is critical. Um, we talk about the need for more data standards and acquisition methodologies, and then even just the definitions. And so right here, um, on the right, you see the USGS kind of traditional um, representations of, of different types of landslides from Curtin and Varnes. Um, and if you click once more, um, you know, this is another example of, of in, in, as we look at remote sensing, you know, how we can really define um, landslides in a different way. If, if you click once more, hopefully it comes up. If not, no worries. Um, and so we really need to kind of advance our ability to have open data repositories here. There we go. So this is this is an example of an algorithm developed by our team by Bukhara Matia, where we can take a, a look at a high resolution image and identify initiation points. Um, but how you move from that to an authoritative or benchmark data set on landslides to use in early warning systems is, I mean, there's a there's a big jump. Um, and so the goal of this group is to really help to identify best practices or effective practices in the space, and, and then also start to, to bring together some of that information to be references for the other working groups. So if you go forward, um, you know, we, um, there's a lot of different types of inventories that are out there. So this is just an example from our team's uh, landslide viewer. So this is fatal or information based on landslide fatalities and the size of the dot indicates the number of fatalities. This is all from media reports, um, but we've now increasingly 
provided more databases within the system um, for event-based inventories that are using the SALAD algorithm that the car has developed to create essentially clusters of landslides from events. Um, and if you go forward, you know, one of the challenges here is, is how we create and link different types of data sources. And so, um, you know, as a team, we've identified different challenges or opportunities here of, of how we, we link, you know, event-based inventories versus more uh, multi-temporal inventories, if you keep clicking. Um, so, you know, one challenge is linking different data sources within a common environment, and I'll give you one example of that. Um, but that the USGS has done. If you keep clicking, I think it's a little bit slow. My apologies on my side. Um, and then, of course, you know, we need different types of inventories for you know, different models. And so the type of slope failures, locations, reporting bias, and characterizing that, all of those are fundamental to really understanding them to use in landslide early warning systems. And if you click once more, um, and then forcing data. So how how is other you know, data could be used, such as precipitation information, hydrology, soil moisture, um, you know, really understanding the auxiliary or complementary data sets to specific landslide inventories that can inform and improve these processes. So we're not just talking about landslide inventories, but more broadly about other um, complementary information that helps us to, um, to better understand the whole picture of landslide hazards. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, and so, you know, in terms of the location, obviously we also need to know um, the timeliness and the accuracy. And so what we found is there's, there's really across the board a lack of common indicators on data quality. So quantifying uncertainty metrics or, or um, the need for really establishing criteria that can be best practice is something that the team identified quite early on, the working group, as really being important in moving the field forward. And then of course, Complementary to that is the evaluation of, of emerging data products, satellite information, new surface-based observations, et cetera, to really balance the local precision versus the capability to scale these landslide early warning systems more broadly. And so there's a lot of different aspects to data. And if you go forward, um, I wanted to give, if I remember what's next, um, yeah, I wanted to give one example of what we're talking about. And so this is actually um, an example from the 2021 earthquake that hit Haiti. And then it was followed shortly after that by the tropical storm Grace. Um, and so what happened was um, in right during that event and subsequently after, we worked across different groups. So Jean-Philippe Millet in France, who's gonna be presenting this at the CIOS working group this week, the Committee on Earth Observing Satellites, you can see it at the top, um, as well as um, BGC, so a group in Canada, the USGS, um, our group at NASA, we all were working in different capacities to better understand quickly where the landslides were on this landscape. So what we ended up doing was, um, and I'll show you, is that we, we started to get, bring all of the information together and, and to start to understand, thank you, start to understand what products and what sources were available for the, for the information. So you can see the, you know, NASA was using synthetic aperture radar, um, you know, CNES was using PLEAD data, et cetera. Uh, USGS was using high resolution commercial imagery. So if you keep clicking, right, there's a lot of different types of information used to generate landslide inventories. And the question is, what is going to be the best or the most effective way to characterize landslides um, in this space? And can this be used in the future for landslide, you know, for understanding landslide early warnings? So you see the aerial coverage of the different responses are quite different, right? So for, you have SAR heat maps, so I'll, I'll show you that. We have um, more optical based methods with HazMapper from, from BGC and others, and then you have kind of very local um, coverage with, with um, an algorithm called Aladdin by Jean-Philippe Millet. So if you go to the, the next slide, um, I'll show you an example of that. So first we have manual mapping of landslides, right? We, we can use Sentinel-2, we use Maxar and Planet, high resolution data to map landslides. Um, so you can see kind of the inventory that was used by USGS or developed by USGS and others to look at the initiation the zones and where they go. If you keep going, so this is work that we did with um, 
with uh, Al Handberger leading that effort. And, and so what we did was we actually used, um, quick, shortly after the event, we looked at the backscatter from the synthetic aperture radar from Sentinel-1 to look at the heat maps of where there were landslide that were likely. So kind of, we called it potential landslide areas, higher density and lower density. And so this is, it gets refined as more SAR images come in, but it's actually another form of an inventory um, to represent the broad characterization of where landslides may be. And then if you keep going, we have an example from, um, from NDVI differencing. So how we look at um, Sentinel-2, kind of more moderate-ish uh, resolution to look at landslides. And if you click again, you can see some of the higher resolution as well. So this is a LADIM um, using Pleiad, which is the, the highest resolution. And so who's right, right? If you click once more, the question is, um, how can we learn more about the different data sources to better understand the relationship of landslides in the landscape and use that more effectively in the future to improve landslide early warning. And so this is exactly what we're writing a paper on right now is to highlight the differences, the different methods, what we're finding, if you click once more, in terms of the types of polygons that are represented, the frequency area distribution, um, who, you know, who's able to map, you know, what types of, of, um, of landslide distributions. And I think this is a really important indicator of how we can move the field forward in this data working group to really highlight examples of, okay, we have one event, how are we mapping differently? And so what we've all come to is this need for an open and organized repository. Um, you know, how can we link information together, how we can manage that information? Um, that's a challenge and that's something from the U.S. that Ben Miras has been very focused on with his colleagues, um, including me, about how do we kind of bring different inventories together and, and how we update those of different quality, um, different you know, methodologies, et cetera. So if you go forward, um, this is one example here is, is the US landslide inventory. So this was pioneered by, by Ben Miris. And so what this does is, is it actually is bringing different US inventories together. It highlights um, high confidence to kind of probable landslides based on the colors, red being the highest confidence. And it gives some quality measures to the inventory so that people know how to use them. So this type of approach um, you know, could be something that we consider for this broader data working group effort. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, that's really how we're starting to kind of form what's next, which is um, a white paper or, or a, a peer reviewed paper, really talking about the landscape, data availability, the needs, opportunities for next generation landslide early warning systems. The goal is to create a reference document for many of the things that I just talked about working with our, with our team to really compare and contrast the availability of information to inform landslide early warning systems when an approach such as you know a SAR based method could be useful and and the outcomes there relative to more you know high resolution imagery that can give you much more accurate landslide data um, and so the 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 outline for this paper is is kind of somewhat annotated below you can start to see you know the data considerations thank you the types of topologies how do we consider different approaches to, um, to data collection, to the methodologies for getting landslide inventories, the available data that's av that, is, um, that can be used, as well as auxiliary data, such as rainfall, soil moisture, snow melt, data that can understand what is triggering the events, but also help you get a better sense of the timing of the events. And if you click once more, I wanted to end, uh, or one more is talking about um, the challenges and opportunities, right? So we highlighted quite a few different discrepancies of how we combine information or shouldn't um, and, and where that's coming from. And so, you know, some of the deliverables of this type of paper would be a flow chart um, potentially for decision making or, or um, you know, helping to outline, you know, best practices to, um, to identify event-based inventories versus multi-temporal inventories. Um, and providing some open data um, examples of, you know, where can we host this information? Um, and so to, to that end, what we've been doing is talking, we've been developing a benchmark data set list of open data products that has information on the name, 
email, name the data set, the link, a description. So this is available at the Google Doc here, which I will put in the chat if possible. Um, so if people do have inventories that they would like to consider for this benchmark data set grouping, at least the initial grouping, um, we really encourage your involvement, encourage you to participate in this working group. We promise to have more frequent meetings coming up. And, um, and I do think that, you know, that collectively on behalf of Ben and I, that we um, we really have an opportunity here to bring some more open data together to support landslide early warning systems and um, and many of the uh, identify many of the effective practices to to really get at a broader set of inventories to improve our modeling capabilities more broadly. So with that, I'm going to stop. Um, I think that I have a I think Ben or Thomas or others may be here if you want to chime in. Um, um, but thank you so much, and again, my apologies for not being there in person. Uh, thank you. So maybe we should move forward or wait for if someone has some question from for Dalia. I don't know. Yeah, because she's leaving. If someone has some quick questions, please. Uh, Dr. Dalia, this is Aditya, and I was also part of the working group. Yeah, so I have one question though. So uh, the earthquake induced landslides, the mapping in Haiti, how will that contribute to early warning systems? Because we don't have a way to forecast earthquakes. So, right. so, so mm -hmm. please tell so, me how. Yeah, so, um, so the, it was kind of, it was a cascading hazard event, right? So it was the earthquake, but then a storm hit right afterwards. And so the point of that paper is, is not, is to figure out the most, um, to characterize the different methodologies for getting the inventories, right? So we we need more landslide inventories to improve our early warning systems. We need event-based inventories specifically. But the question of what method produces what quality of inventory is a big open question. Um, and so with this paper, the goal is to actually talk through all of the different methodologies and the results of the inventories that came out of those different methods and to provide some insight into what type of uh, methodology could be used for an event in the future. So it's more, it's more guidance on the future of inventory compilation and not that it was an earthquake triggered versus rainfall. Um, I will say we have about 20 to 25 event-based inventories in, this, in the um, landslides.nasa.gov viewer um, that are from primary from rainfall triggered events. And so I think that as we grow that, as we have open source code that others can deploy um, in Google Earth Engine, in other, you know, Amazon Web Services. So our code is open. Um, if, if more people are able to create inventories and share them, then that is the way that we grow that community of, of inventories. The challenge is, is we need a, a kind of a way to bring that information together and understand the quality and methods behind it. And I think that's really where our, um, where we're really trying to move forward. Thank you. For the Thank question. you. Any other question? Comment? No. Okay. So I think you, Dalia. Uh, let's move to the final presentation of today made by Luca Pizzullo is uh, it will focus on the last uh, working group that was not pre present at the, at the when Landover was born. It was a newborn working group um, focused on uh, Internet of Thing, I think, and innovation in uh, in landslide early warning systems. Please. Yes, thank you, Stefano. I hope last but not least, <laughs> just trying to use the. Um, let me check if I manage. Yes, great. Yeah, that's working. That's fine. It's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Let's start with. Uh, I'm gonna be brief. I know everybody started, myself as well included. This working group is kind of newborn. It started this year, and uh, from uh, NGI, which is the institute I belong to, it's myself and Dylan Mikesell, which is there. 
My back, I'm a geotechnical engineer with a uh, background about slope stability and laser early warning systems, while Dylan there is a geophysicist and expertise in fiber optic sensing and not only. So this uh, working group is about IoT, yeah, it's a buzz, buzzword, it's just to attract uh, people, but basically re real time monitoring and warning. So this is the purpose, we wanna investigate uh, different solutions in real time with the aim of having a, a real time or near real time, uh, a, a real time warning. What are the objectives of this working group? So um, application of innovative and traditional sensors. So this is what we are doing. We are trying to investigate what is around in terms of a new way of monitoring and real-time monitoring. Then, sorry, then share experiences. So that's the aim of this networking. So sharing experiences on, of monitoring, but not only. Also modeling, it's very important. If you want to do, then if you want to have in place a, a, a lens light early warning system. I forgot to mention one important thing. This working group is more focused on local lens the early warning system compared to the others. So here the scale is different. And of course, if the scale is different, then the monitoring systems are also different. And the monitoring techniques that you used are different. Uh, point three, starting with existing case studies. This is something that we were discussing before and including more additional ones proposed by the group members. So we wanna work on existing case studies, existing monitored, uh, monitoring data sets uh, to uh, apply different modeling and then to use this as, with the final aim of using this as uh, for warning purposes. So this working group aims at sharing knowledge, collaborative environment, practically applying new methods and innovative sensors to different case studies. One more time just in a simplified way, share case studies. Use these case studies as test methods to test models, to test sensors, whatever, new sensors. So this is the main, the main thing. So these are the three main aspects. Share case study, test methods, test new instruments. And we wanna do that following the FAIR data, the FAIR principle. So it means that we're gonna share and we are gonna meet this the, the, the principle of find, findability of the data, accessibility, interoperability, and reuse, reusability. Activities. So practically, what we are doing. So we have done so. What we have done so far. Webinars. We have done mostly. Then we have done a couple of one of two seminars to Norwegian universities, and we are doing networking, and we will, and we are starting co new collaborations. So this is what we are doing. I'm gonna show you the timeline of the activities, of the activities that we have carried out and the activities that we are going to carry out. So this is our timeline. So it goes from May when we had the kickoff meeting until July, so July, 2023. So this is what we have planned so far. So kickoff in May, just to the a speedy kickoff. I would say, because it was just half an hour just to define what, what was the aim. And then we have the, done the first workshop in July about geophysical monitoring. Then we had the second workshop about recently uh, about monitored case studies. And then we are actually here now. So this is the physical meeting that we are having about Landauer. Then we are gonna have other three workshop about hydrological modeling or other case studies. I'm not sure about that. We need to talk about and we need to define what would be the topic of workshop three. And then workshop four, IoT monitoring and data processing and machine learning implementation. So the idea here behind this timeline is to slowly build up the knowledges, the case studies, and then to end up with the final aim of having like, as I said, an IoT based monitoring, modeling, and finally, <laughs> uh, early warning. Then in May, I think it's for many of us, it's a good moment to meet, actually it's April, the EGU is not May this year. So um, 
to meet at EGU physically. And then together with Dylan, we were planning to have a, a physical gathering, a small kind of workshop of this working group in Oslo, right before the JTC, the Joint Technical Committee on Landslide Conference that will be in Oslo in June next year. Okay, this is briefly the timeline. Institutes involved so far. So in these two uh, workshops, these are the institutes. I'm not, not mentioning the people because there are several people from the same institutes. As you can see, many from Norway, BGC, for all over the world, more or less. University of Florence, we have a, a strong collaboration with Emanuele Intrieri and Veronica Tofani there, and also uh, others. Just briefly what we have done. Workshop one, it was about se seismic noise and geophysical monitoring. There was Professor Eric LaRose that was describing monitoring landslide and rockfall deformation with low cost sensor, the same tools that you, the, the clothes tags, or in few words, and a very innovative way of monitoring. Then Jim Whiteley from BGS, I think Jim has changed uh, recently or not, still BGS, I'm not sure. Uh, the, so he was describing this case study of the Holling Hill and ERT monitoring, long-term ELT monitoring kind of. And then Margot Zadashime, actually from, from this institute, a very interesting, another interesting presentation about ambient noise monitoring. And she was showing something about the Ilgraben uh, debris flow. So, and I forgot to mention that we have a OneDrive folder with all the material collected, all the presentations. So if you have missed it, don't worry, you can, and if you have, uh, if you have joined this working group, you will receive the email by me or Dylan, and you will have access to this OneDrive folder. Workshop two was more focused on real case studies. And uh, we had Emanuele Intrieri describing what uh, they have done in terms of monitoring of the Torcio Vannetto landslides in Umbria region, Italy. And then Armin, actually, it's not uh, paying attention. <laughs> yeah, we made a very nice presentation about soil wetness monitoring in the NAF region that we're going to uh, see uh, tomorrow in the Emmental, uh, Emmental area, right? And then Professor Claudia Messina, there is uh, Margherita, PhD student here, and it's about hydrological mo monitoring for lens early warning system. And this was the case study of the Oltrepo Pavese. The, this workshop has been recorded so you can go on this is the link and you can go and follow the uh, the presentation if you missed it just summing up i don't want to take too much time what are the rules to join uh, the working group eight there are no rules actually the only thing you need to do you need to register on the landware on the landware and then you need to make the preference that you want to follow this working group basically if this is the first time you are joining this, uh, you are joining the group, you don't have to fight. You just need to fill the questionnaire. So this is an open-ended questionnaire that we are having because we want to collect information from you. We want to collect information from, from uh, about different case studies, if you have case studies, if you have models, uh, in order to, to go forward with our, with our aim. I don't know how many minutes I have left. I have some results here. Can I go a couple of minutes? Yeah. Let's see some results of this, um, of the, this open-ended questionnaire. Do you collect your own data? Yes. So 15 out of uh, 20 here, 23, have replied yes. And what is the temporal resolution? Some of them sub-hourly. 10 sub hourly, six hourly. So pretty much high frequency, I would say. What type of data do you monitor? Soil moisture, big one. Many are monitoring soil moisture. Rainfall, another big one. Water, well, water is. Seismic data as well, pore pressure. Temperature, very interesting. So these are things that are monitored from the people that answer it this to this questionnaire and then uh, do you have case study to share yeah well actually 10 10 people out of 22 in this case replied yes and these case studies are about smart monitoring or rockfall 
large scale landslides, uh, shallow landslides, and then the use of robotized inclinometers, geophysical monitoring approaches. So different things are, uh, are monitored here. Then the question about, have you ever made some mistakes? Have you ever failed experiments? Nobody, that, that's a bit, uh, we should go, we should come back with that. We should reformulate these questions in order to, <laughs> to put in a positive way. Uh, tell us about failed experiments. Nobody replied, so because everything is, is fine, apparently. What products would you like to achieve? And this is the main thing, and then I can quickly uh, uh, go to the end. What products would you like to achieve with this working group? And with, the, with, with these activities. S many of us have replied scientific products like peer-reviewed papers, but also a long-term collaboration as well as open access data. And in this regard, our aim here is to produce, to collect different case study pilots, demonstrators, as we were saying before, to share them in open access, to put this data in a repository and to publish this on perhaps nature data with the fair principles. So this is one of the goal. Another goal that can be a scientific product is guidelines of how to instrument a slow. And then also data processing tutorials. From the educational point of view, seminars at universities, and we are already doing virtual webinars and a physical workshop is under is, is the plan for, 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 for next year. A few info, uh, there is, there is it's gonna be a new um, session about that. Uh, I have proposed it together with Michele and, uh, and others, Claudia Messina and also Tom Bogart and Ben Myrus, uh, this session about IoT-based monitoring, modeling and machine learning analysis of weather-induced landslides. EGU, as I said, can be a good moment to meet again and to have brainstorming. And then there is the World Landslide Forum 6, and I think many of us are going to be, to be present there. Last thing, really the last thing, for, from our side, we have two pilots, that we are gonna share with everybody. One is very low, is local, it's a slope. We have instrumented this slope with several uh, sensors. We have a very long data set in terms of soil water content, six years. And then we have recently installed uh, suction sensors, a weather station. There is two, uh, There are two inclinometers, well, but this slope is stable, so inclinometers are not measuring anything, uh, nothing uh, useful. Um, piezometers. Then we have used one year of this data to, and we have built our model. We have calibrated and validated this model. Then we have computed the factor of safety, and then with machine learning technique, we have used. We we, we have we wanted to understand how important the volumetric water content was in predicting the factor of safety. So this is what we are working on with this uh, case study, and we are happy to share the data set, everything. And the other one is uh, at the regional scale. It's Trollstegen. It's a very beautiful area. I never I, I actually I should be I should be there because it's a very nice from the touristic point of view. But many of you already have noticed that. Yeah, it's nice, but perhaps it can be a bit dangerous. So you can see that there are signs over here. Uh, you know, a few that it's not so safe coming here in the in the wrong period of the year. So this is a nice side, but this has also a darker side, as we used to say. So debris flows, rock falls, and other issues. So this is another case study that we want to use, and we, we recently installed a weather station, and we are also using uh, uh, other data to, to kind of build some uh, thresholds and then uh, a, a, an early warning system. I can end my presentation here. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, that's all. Thank you, Luca. So we have just uh, 
25 minutes, 20 to 25 minutes for the last discussion. If you have any comments or suggestions for Graciela, Daria, if she's in here, or Luca, please. Hi, this is Dylan Mikesell from NGI. I have a question for Dahlia. Um, is she there? Hi. Dahlia, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, in one of your slides, you, you had a comment just about the inventory completeness. Hmm. And I'm, I'm curious maybe to get everybody's opinion in the room of um, what does that completeness completeness look like? And is there some kind of threshold that you have defined that indicates uh, the completeness of a catalog? So I think that, that that's a great question. Um, I think that it really depends on what you're using it for. Um, and in terms of the model, the resolution of the model, the intention um, to really define what you need for completeness. So, um, so the answer, I guess, is no, not yet. Um, when we're talking about the Haiti example, um, you know, we have the ability to create pretty quick inventories, especially if there's cloud-free imagery, um, if there's, you know, decent synthetic aperture radar overpasses. So the speed at which we can create inventories is helpful because it gives you maybe the 60 to 80 percent solution of of kind of where landslides are existing. And for a model such as the one we have at NASA, it's a one kilometer resolution. So just getting a sense of the, are there landslides here or not at a one kilometer range is sufficient to help improve our modeling. And the speed at which we can get that information is helpful for emergency response. On the confluence, on the opposite side, right? Um, if you're trying to develop a, a geotechnical model or a deterministic model, you know, having information such with volume estimates, such as what Aladdin is, is working on to both give the area and volume of specific polygons, that informs the local slope stability analyses and, and deterministic models that, you know, depending if you're trying to create an early warning system for a specific hill slope, et cetera, that's the level of resolution you want. And so I think that those traits are it that whole trade space is important to really provide guidance to the community on what what could be used. So I think that in, it's the same is true with inventory completeness um, because it depends on the resolution of the data you have, uh, the the remote sensing information you have, as well as kind of how you're compiling it. So it's not a black and white issue. It's more of a a, a trying to provide guidance for what model you're using issue, if that makes sense. And if not, I can keep going. <laughs> no, you're good. They took the mic. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mauro, please. Yes. Ciao, Dalia. Um, I was just thinking to the completeness uh, word. I will suggest to change the word completeness in representativeness because yeah. we are all geologists and we know that uh, not, uh, complete data set does not exist. Mm -hmm. While it's fundamental for us and for modeling training, having uh, representative data sets. So I will focus much more on this particular uh, understanding on, on the data that we have, that is what it really cares whenever we train models. Thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a really great, uh, a great point, Mauro. I, I totally agree. And, um, and I invite anybody who'd like to engage on this topic and, and work on a paper together to bring their expertise and their, um, their perspective to bear. Um, please join us in, in trying to draft this, this work, because I think that it will help us to hone the, the words that we use in, in kind of characterizing the types of inventories and the quality, et cetera, that are um, able to be developed and the intention of them. So if that's a pitch for contributing information or contributing your time to, to work on this, I, that'd be great. 
There's Lisa. Yeah, I, I wanted to agree with the with the um, perhaps considering representativeness and add to it at the level of uncertainty that you want. So how certain do you want it? That's going to determine how many you need for training models. So I think those are those are the things to consider. Absolutely. Uh, hello, Dalia, uh, Aditya again. I was just wondering uh, if we are saying uh, if you're using still using the term completeness, uh, how do we add on to the literature? We are we have an index of completeness that's already published, uh, but like a Norwegian Institute, uh, geophysical person was saying, I forgot your name. I'm sorry. So uh, there is no threshold of uh, number or the resolution or the area mapped for total totality or the completeness per se. Uh, but like like uh, you also mentioned and others mentioned, it depends on what we use the inventories for. Uh, but we also having uh, to look at how much of this data set goes on towards uh, saving lives. I mean, that's the end, end product of the whole thing. So, I mean, maybe if we can base the completeness based on that, I mean, that could be a, I mean, a good standard because if we use these data sets to reduce the risk, disaster risk, then we are going to use it through different models. Now, different models will have different uh, inputs. And if you base the completeness only based on those, uh, that could become uh, tool specific or, you know, methodology specific. But yeah. if we can make the completeness more on result specific uh, based on hazard or early warning, I, I think that could be more uh, useful for the scientific community. Thank you. Thank you, Adityan. Yeah, um, I've, I've been, Mira's post in the chat, um, kind of that representativeness is a better word. And so there, well, there are metrics for, um, to you know, to define completeness of an in event, event inventory, specifically for earthquakes. We don't really know what it's representative enough to train a model. And, and I think that's to the point that you were saying, which is if we, if we focus on, you know, on the hazard or the impact of landslides, right? It could both bias our model, right? So if you're only looking about uh, at landslides along roads, because we know that that is where you're gonna have the most impact, the model could end up being quite biased. And so this is why we need to have these discussions to, to talk through what the intention of the models are. And we need to understand the null data sets, especially if you're doing machine learning approaches um, to ensure that you don't over parameterize or overfit your models to a set of data. And that's something that Thomas Stanley has, has talked a lot about um, and worked on in, in some of his recent work, as well as, as many of you in the, in the group. So I think that there's an important balance that has to happen. And, and the goal of the working group is to talk through kind of the intention of, as you said, the modeling output, and then kind of what, what type of inventory you may need to get there, and then, even further, what type of methodology could be appropriate for that type of inventory? So you can see the flow chart is very important in this type of work. Oh, Andrea, Andrea Manconi. Thank you. Uh, question for working group eight. I don't see Luke anymore. Yeah, this here. So about the sharing of data for this uh, case studies. Do you have any idea on how to select these case studies or is it just an initiative to put together as much as you can? So th did you think what is the selection strategy for the case studies that might be shared to the community or not? Okay, well, what we have so far is uh, case studies and uh, at, at a slope scale, so local and early warning systems. So about monitoring, uh, so this is the case of Porto de Popa Vese. This is the case of, because Professor Claudia Messina also agreed on share the data. So it's mostly about uh, monitoring rainfall, monitoring temperature, monitoring water content. Suction if you have, if you do, do not have, it doesn't matter, for water pressure. So this is mostly what we are doing unsaturated 
conditions, triggering of possible shallow landslides. This is mostly what we are now dealing with these two case studies. The other one that I showed, and I guess this is the same that you have here in, uh, in, the, in the case studies that you are monitoring. The other case study troll Stegen, that's another type of thing. So we want to focus mostly on, uh, on this. But then, of course, it depends on how many <laughs> case studies and uh, researchers or scientists or others are interested in sharing this data. So, so far we have two, three. It would be nice to have more. And it would be nice to put, to write some, something about that and to publish on this uh, nature data journal and put all these data sets in a repository. Yeah, just quickly replying to the data sharing. So my comment was related to the fact that I've seen several times this initiative to share the data uh, because maybe a group was not really keen on sharing the data because of publication issues. So now we are much more forced to publish also the data. But on the contrary, what I've seen is that most of the people, they are not using this data. So after such a large pressure really to share these data sets, maybe these data sets are not used. So before we need to think what is really representative and really necessary before to share it just for sharing. That was basically my, my comment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. So I will pass the mic to Manfred for, uh, for concluding this session and this day. 